I want you to read that with me this morning. That 46th verse. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Ready? Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Ready? Read. And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Amen. I want to share this morning from the subject of, Is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your Lord? Let us pray. Father, have your way. Father, use us. For your will and your glory. Overshadowed now by your Holy Spirit. Cover me, Father. Allow that Holy Spirit that you send to rise up through me. And preach your word. Empower me for this moment. Let the word come forth with boldness, with clarity, with understanding, with conviction. And I pray, God, that you would open our ears and help us to listen. Open our eyes, for we want to see Jesus. And I pray that you will open our hearts that we might receive him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Many of you may have heard of a poem called Invictus. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any here today with us, but... Most likely, if you are a Q dog or from the fraternity Omega Sci Fi, you were told that you had to memorize the poem Invectus. And that poem goes like this Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from people from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for that my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishments, the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That's a poem by William Ernest Hensley. Or Hensley. He basically declares in this poem, Invectus, that he's the master of his soul. He declares in this poem that he is in control of his life. No one else but him. And sadly to say there are many today that say the same thing. You might not use the same words that he used. You might not say it the same way that he said it. But ultimately we're saying the same thing to God that I am the master of my soul. I am in charge of my own life and I don't need you God to run it. I don't need you God to tell me what to do. 
we may not say it that straight out, but we say it sometimes with our actions. When we fail to do what God has asked us to do, we're basically saying, I am the master of my own soul. When we fail to keep the commands that God has given us, we're basically saying, I am the master of my own soul. We may not have written the poem in Victus, but we live it out day by day. Every time we don't do what God has asked us to do, we're basically saying the same thing that William Henley said. Every time we neglect to do the things that God's word expresses to us as we read it or as we hear it, we're basically saying the same, same thing that the writer of this poem has said. I want to help us this morning to realize that man, as the scripture says, does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We live by the word of God. We breathe by the word of God. We have our existence by the very word of God. And when we neglect it, when we fail to do what it's asking us to do, we're basically saying, I am the master of my own soul. I'm the master of my fate. I determine what I shall be and what I shall do. But God says that he's the master, not only of our souls, but he's the master of this world. He's the master of this universe. And unless we fall into his hands and unless we surrender to his will and his way, we are guilty of saying the same thing that William Henley has said. Actually, many quote this poem, and I remember there was some folk that, uh, part of the church that, you know, again, they belong to Omega Sci-Fi, and they will stand proudly and proclaim this poem. And all the while, it's an insult to God. It's an insult to the very God that we say we trust and that we believe in, because we're saying that we are the masters of our own soul. But if we look at this text, I think Jesus tells us and he explains to us how to know if he is the Lord of our lives. When I look at verse 46, I see this Jesus asked a very convicting question. The question that Jesus asked in verse 46 is, And why call me Lord, Lord? And do not do the things that I say. Jesus asked a very convicting question to the crowd that was gathered there. He basically told them, why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Master? And you don't do a thing that I say. Why do you come at me with your words, but you don't follow me with your actions? Amen. This is not man questioning, but God questioning. And he's saying, if you're going to honor me with your lips, let your heart be there too. If you're going to honor me with your lips, let your actions follow what your lips say. We say we are Christian. We say that we are those who belong to God, but we show something different when we live our everyday lives. If we're not following and doing what God has asked us to do, we have basically said, I'm the master of my own soul. But we've got to understand that Jesus asked a convicting question. And if we ask ourselves this question, is Jesus the Lord of my life? Is he Lord in my life or am I just giving lip service? We've got to ask ourselves that question because Jesus confronts us with his lordship. The crowd that gathered that day, Jesus is asking them, am I the Lord of your life? Am I Lord in your life? Am I the master? Am I the one that's responsible for you? Am I your Lord? And he's wanting them to understand that if you're going to call me Lord, there's something else that's got to go along with that. Your actions. You can't call me Lord and then do something else. You can't call me Lord and then go against the things that I command you to do. That's why he says, why are you calling me Lord, but you do not do the things that I say? We give verbal acknowledgments of lordship. We will verbally acknowledge that God is our master. 
When somebody asks you, are you a church member or you say, you'll say yes. You're verbally acknowledging that God is your master. But when they see you live otherwise, amen. When they see you talk otherwise, what you just said was, I said he's my master with my lips, but with my actions I said, I'm my master. Amen. When I don't do the things that God has asked me to do, but I live the way I want to live, I act the way I want to act, I talk the way I want to talk, I'm basically saying that God is not my master at all. If he's going to be my master, and if I'm going to call him master, I've got to make my speech and my actions line up. My speech and my actions must come together. I can't call Jesus Lord, but then I cuss folk out. Well, then we say he's Lord, but he's not Lord of my mouth. I can't call him Lord, but I keep on hating my brothers and sisters. He told us to love. I, I can't call him Lord, but I keep on disobeying my parents. He says, honor your mother and your father. I can't call him Lord, but I treat my wife any kind of way. He said, husbands, love your wife the way Christ loved the church. I can't call him Lord, but I disrespect my husband. Wives, respect your husbands. I can't call him Lord, but I disrespect the elderly of the church. He said, honor them like they're your mother and your father. If we're going to do and be what God has called us to be, if we're going to call him Lord, we've got to do what he says. I can't call him Lord, and then I'm not willing to do anything that they ask me to do in the church. He's given everyone a gift that's in the body of Christ. He expects everyone to use that gift in the body of Christ. But how can I call him Lord, but I refuse to use my gift? How can I call him Lord, and I refuse to serve in his kingdom? Yet and still, I call him Lord. Yet and still, I call him my Jesus. How can I call him Lord, but I don't do what he says? We have to acknowledge that we neglect Jesus in our actions. We've got to acknowledge that we do not do everything that God's told us to do. That's a starting point. Acknowledge that I'm not doing what God has told me to do. And then start doing what he's told you to do. Amen. Amen. If we're going to call him Lord, let's be able to call him Lord and then show that he is my Lord. I don't want to just call him Lord, but I want to show that he is my Lord. I show that he's my Lord by what I do. I show that he's my Lord by the way that I carry myself. I show that he's Lord by the way that I talk. I show that he's Lord by the way that I love. I show that he's my Lord by the things that I do. We can talk all day long. You know a lot of folk that give you lip service. They say stuff to you. They say stuff and they say stuff, but they don't do anything. They tell you they're going to do this and they tell you they're going to do that. And they do none of what they say. That's lip service. We can't do that to God. We can't give him lip service and then turn around and don't do a thing that we say. You got folk will shout heaven down on Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Glory. He's God. Hey. And go right out there and live like a fool. Who's the Lord of their life? God says, if you're calling me Lord, then do what I say. Amen. If you're calling me Lord, live according to my word. If you're going to call me Lord, listen to me. Jesus asked a very convicting question. If you're calling me Lord, why don't you do what I say? That's the first thing we've got to get over is that convicting question. And then we've got to understand that Jesus gives understanding of his lordship. In verse 47 it says, And whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. Jesus gives an understanding about his lordship. He said, I'll show you what it's like for him that comes to me. I'll show you what it's like for you to truly be one of my disciples. First of all, he says, he comes to me. We've got to first start off by coming to Jesus. 
Many of us have come to Christ. We've gotten saved. Many of us have made the first step. We walked the walk. We came down the aisle. Or we were at home. Or maybe you were in your bathroom. Wherever you received salvation, it didn't matter. You came to Christ. That was the first step. Coming to Him, acknowledging that you need Him, that is the first step. Many of us refuse sometimes to acknowledge that we need God. We revert back to that invectives. I'm the captain of my own fate. I'm the master of my own soul. I don't need God. Let me tell you something. You need God every minute that you're alive. You need God every second that you live. Without Him, you don't exist. Without Him, you can't keep on existing. You need God whether you understand it or not. We need the Lord. Every minute, every hour, every second, we need the Lord. We soon forget sometimes that we need the Lord and we neglect the Lord, but we have to understand that we have to first come to Him and you've got to come for yourself. Amen. Your mama can't make you come and get saved. Your daddy can't make you come and get saved. Grandma, auntie, uncle, you got to come for yourself. Amen. When you come for yourself, it's because you realize you need God. It's because you realize you need a Savior. It's because you realize I'm ready to give my life to the Lord and I don't want to just have it be such a lip service. I'm coming because I sincerely want my life to turn and change. I'm coming because I really want God to be the head of my life. So we come and we come to God and we come to Jesus and we hear Notice what he said. He will come to me and hear my sayings. That's why it's important that we as believers put ourselves in position to hear the word as much as possible. Amen. That's why we can't neglect church. Hallelujah. That's why we can't neglect Bible study, Sunday school. Those are the avenues in which we can hear God's word. Those are the avenues in which we can hear God's instruction coming into our ears. We hear the word. You can't neglect reading your word. You hear the word when you read it. Amen. Amen. You read it out loud. If you say, I can't hear, read it out loud. As you read your Bible out loud, you're hearing the word. You're seeing the word. You're taking the word in. We should make ourselves available to receive the word in as many avenues as possible. Because when we hear the word, how can I keep the word if I'm not hearing the word? How can I keep the word if I'm not putting myself in position to get the word? But if I'm coming to church, if I'm coming to Sunday school, if I'm coming to Bible study, I make myself available to hear the word of God. You know, it, it is, in this generation, this day and time, the Church is not what it used to be. When my grandmom and them was coming up, church was, you know, you go to church, you're going to stay all day. You leave early in the morning, you go to church, they're going to hit Sunday school. When Sunday school was over, you might have a chance to run by the candy store. You know, the world, the world and the folk in the world are smart. They know them church kids want candy. So they open up right around the Sunday school hour time, Sunday school letting out. Amen. You run by there and you get your candy and then you go on back to church and you sit on that back pew peeling open your nail laters and peeling open your candy. And them ushers telling you you can't eat candy in church. Grandma and them stayed at church. When they went from Sunday school, they went to church service. And when they went from church service, they just went and packed the lunch while they were there and they ate lunch right there on the church ground. And then they went on back for the evening or the afternoon service. They was in church all day. And guess what? They enjoyed it. You didn't, but they enjoyed it. Amen. They enjoyed it. It was something to them that they wanted to be there and they couldn't get enough. But for us, this generation, this day and time, we act like we don't need God. We act like we don't need church. We act like we don't need the word. Jesus said, you come to me. And hear my word. When we have revival, every member should be here. The revival is for us. 
We invite other folk to come and, and celebrate and be revived with us, but we have revival for us. Amen. Amen. Whenever we have other avenues where you can come and, and have the word of God talk and spoken to our hearing, we should make ourselves available to it. Sister girls in Christ, when they have their monthly meeting and function, somewhere in there the word of God is going to be shared or should be shared, and somewhere in there you can hear the word of God. We have men's Bible study once a month. You can come and hear the word of God dealing with it from a man's perspective. We make ourselves available to the word, and as we hear the word, we can make ourselves grow in Christ because we put ourselves in position to hear the word of God. And when we put ourselves in position to hear the word of God, I think this is the problem because of what Jesus said. Why do you hear me, but then don't do what I told you to do? We don't want to hear the word because we don't want to be held accountable. But as the uh, bulletin pointed out, ignorance is no excuse. We can't claim ignorance. Well, I didn't know that. There's a lot of stuff you don't know. Amen. You don't know how much time you get for robbing somebody, do you? But I guarantee if you do it, you're going to get the time. It's a lot of stuff you don't know when it comes to the world. You can claim ignorance in the world. But guess what? They still going to hold you accountable. But when it comes to God's kingdom, we think we can still claim that ignorance and not be held accountable. No, God said if you hear it, if you know it, you're going to be held accountable for it. And some of us think because we haven't heard it, because we haven't learned it, we won't be held accountable for it. And, wrong answer. You're going to be held accountable. Ignorance is not an excuse. And Jesus not only said you got to come to him, you got to hear him. He says you got to act on Jesus' words and commands. He knows what he says. I'm going to show you. He that comes to me and hear my sayings and do of them. That is a person who does what I says. That is a person who can answer affirmative, is Jesus your Lord? Because I hear what he says. I come to him, first of all, I receive salvation, and I hear what he's saying. And not only that I heard what he said, but I put into practice what I heard him say. If I were to ask you what's the last word of God that you heard, that you actually put in practice, what would it be? What would it be? The last command that you heard from the word of God that you actually put into practice. How long has it been? Are you still practicing it? He said you'll know if I'm your Lord by what you do. If you're doing the things that I've asked you to do, then I'm your Lord. If you're not doing the things that I've asked you to do, you need to check. Ask yourself, is he Lord of my life? And then you got the last thing I want to share with us. Jesus provides an illustration. In verses 48 through 49, we see that Jesus gives us an illustration on what it's like to have him as Lord and what it's like to not have him as Lord. In verse 48, he said, He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation, built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Jesus contrasts two people here. The one who listens to what he says and the one who does not. First of all, we've got to understand, if you're going to be the man that built his house upon the rock, you've got to dig deep. Remember we shared that a while back in our series on spiritual growth? Y'all forgot already, huh? One of the principles was you had to dig deep. The one thing we have to understand is if we're going to do what God has asked us to do, it means we're going to have to put some work in. We're going to have to work, and it's not necessarily going to be easy work. If we're honest, which I believe we all are honest, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. 
we should be able to look deep within us and say, I'm missing this. I'm missing that. I need to fix it. We should be able to do the hard work that it's going to take to straighten out the things that we need to straighten out. We should do the hard work that it's going to take to follow the Word of God. Amen. Problem is, we keep letting flesh get in the way. We keep letting Satan talk in our ears. And we keep on allowing the enemy to distract us. And the thing that we have to understand is, if I'm going to dig deep, there may be some things that I'm going to have to deal with, and it may be hard. It may be difficult. Example. I call Jesus Lord, but I'm shacking. It's going to be a hard choice. Amen. Because somebody said, I can't pay my bills by myself. What we're saying is, I'm the master of my soul. I don't care what Jesus said, I'm going to keep shacking. Hard truth this morning. We call Jesus Lord, but we keep on fornicating. I'm the master of my soul. We call Jesus Lord, but we're not paying our tithes and our offering. I'm the master of my soul. We call Jesus Lord, but I can't stand her. I'm the master of my soul. It's going to take some difficult things, and we're going to have to deal with those things because we're going to have to dig deep. Dig deep. But I'd rather dig deep and be confronted with those hard things and to deal with them than to be on the outside of Jesus' control. If we're going to call him master, if we're going to call him Lord, we're going to have to dig deep and deal with some things that are there. The Bible says that we should put all of our cares on Jesus. The Bible says that we should trust him and not worry but we worry. We try to make it happen ourselves. I'm the master of my soul. Jesus told us in his word, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. But I'm worried about what tomorrow brings. I'm worried about what I won't have tomorrow. I'm, worried. I'm bringing my tomorrow into my today. As if I don't have enough troubles today. I reach into tomorrow and bring that trouble into my today. And I'm dealing with my today trouble, my yesterday trouble, and my tomorrow trouble today. Leave that in tomorrow. Leave your yesterday in yesterday. Deal with your stuff today. Deal with the hard stuff today. Yes, it may be difficult. Yes, it may be hard. But we're saying, I'm calling Jesus Lord. And if I'm calling him Lord, then that means he has to be Lord. And if I'm calling him Lord, I've got to act like he's Lord. If I'm acting like he's something else, then I can't call him Lord. If I really want to call Jesus my Lord, my Master, my Savior, then I've got to act like it. I've got to live according to his word. I've got to live according to his command and his statutes. I've got to do what he's asked me to do. Amen. And it means that I've got to lay a foundation. Yes, you're going to have to deal with some hard things, but you're going to have to put a foundation down. You're going to have to lay a foundation and say, this is what I'm laying my foundation on. Now notice what he says. There was one that built his foundation on a rock and one that laid no foundation at all. There are too many folk that call themselves Christian but have no spiritual foundation. We call ourselves Christian, but we don't know what it takes to be saved. We don't know even how to defend our faith. We don't know the first thing about sharing the gospel. We don't know the first thing about how we really got saved, the whole process of salvation. Every Christian ought to have a solid foundation on which they have built upon. We cannot be like the man that just built a house. He had no foundation. It said when the storm came, when the waters came, it flooded that house and washed it away. And notice what it said, great was the fall. Many of us are asking for a great fall. Why? Because we refuse to do what God has asked us. 
We're asking for a great fall. Why? Because we refuse to build a solid foundation. Yes, I've got some tough things I've got to deal with. Yes, I've got some hard things I've got to deal with. But I've got to do those hard things in order to do what God has asked me to do. And when I do that, I've got to make sure that it's on a good, solid foundation. The other man put his foundation on a rock. My God, if you realize what he's saying, he put his foundation on the rock. Jesus Christ. That's where our foundation is built upon. Jesus Christ. Your salvation is because of the grace of Almighty God. Your salvation is based upon your faith that you show in Jesus Christ and Almighty God. It's got nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God and what he's already done. And because of that, I put my faith in him and I build it upon that foundation which Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of. He is the only rock. He is the only foundation that we can build on. And because of that, I have the ability to stand strong in my afflictions and troubles. Many of us wonder why we can't stand strong in the midst of the storms that come our way. Check your foundation. Check and see if you're dealing with the hard things in life. Again, I can't be praying to God. Now, this this just blows my mind. When folks say, I prayed about it. But they're living just as sinful as they can be. Amen. I, I prayed about that thing. But you ain't listening to God whatsoever. We can't say we're praying about something and we ain't even listening to God. What makes us think he wants to listen to us? We can't do a thing he's asked, but we expect him to do everything we ask. Every prayer I bring to him, he's got to answer. Every petition I bring to him, he's got to answer. Every request I put in his presence, he's got to give it to me. But I won't do a thing that he says. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. God is not obligated to do anything for you. Especially if you ain't living for him. He ain't obligated to do a thing for you. Out of his grace and mercy, he gives you life. Out of his grace and mercy, he, he, you know, he kind of lets you do what you want to do. But there are consequences there. But the thing you got to understand is you got the ability to withstand any storm, any affliction, any trouble that comes your way. Especially if you are doing what God has asked you to do. If you're living the way God wants you to live and according to his command and according to his word, whatever trouble comes your way is just trouble coming your way. It's not going to work. That's why the Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Because I'm living in a godly fashion. I'm living according to God's word. I'm living according to God's command. And when I live that way, God is on my side. When I live that way, God is fighting on my behalf. When I live that way, I can call upon heaven and God will come down and see about me. Because I'm doing what he's asked me to do. I'm living according to the way that he wants me to live. But if I'm living like a hellion down here, I can't expect God to step up and fight my battles. I've got to live according to his word, according to his will. If again, if I call him Lord, I've got to do what he says. And as I close, I want us to understand that Jesus asked this question, but what's your answer? Is he Lord? Can you call him Lord? Is Jesus truly the Lord of your life? Is he truly the Lord of our lives? Is he truly the one that we listen to? Is he truly the one that we take our instructions from? Is he truly... The one that leads and guides and directs everything that we do in life? What is our answer? Is our answer yes, he is Lord, or no, according to what I'm checking my life on? I can't say that I can call him Lord. We've got to understand that Jesus has got to be the Lord of our life. If Jesus commands us to repent, then he is Lord. But if we are not repenting, then he's not your Lord. If he's asked us to repent, because he told us in Luke 13 and 3, that we have to repent. In other words, we need to get forgiveness for the wrong that we do. Jesus said, let your light show shine before men. Is your light shining before men, or are you showing them darkness? He told us to let our light shine before men. Is he your Lord? He asked us in, in Matthew 55 and 38 and 42, Jesus told us to overcome evil with good. Are we overcoming evil? evil with good or are we following the old mandate an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth Jesus said overcome evil with good are you overcoming that evil with good or is he your Lord you've got to ask the 
yourself. He, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Are we loving our enemies or are we talking about them? Are we loving our enemies or are we hating them? Are we praying for those who persecute us? Are we praying for those who talk about us? Are we praying for those who run us down? Or are we talking about them? Or are we running them down? Or are we holding hate and animosity towards them? Again, is he your Lord? Jesus commands us to honor our parents, but are we dishonoring our parents? Are we talking back to our parents? Are we disrespecting our parents every turn we get? Are we not honoring the parents the way that God told us to. You know in the Old Testament if we went back to practicing the way that they used to do, they stoned children to death for not listening to their parents. They stoned children to death for disrespecting their parents. But God gave us some grace and some mercy. But we still have children today who disrespect and dishonor their parents. But if they call themselves Christian, if they call themselves a child of God, they can't dishonor their parents. They can't disrespect their parents. The question is, is he your Lord? Jesus commands us to celebrate the Lord's Supper. But sometimes folks don't celebrate the Lord's Supper. My question is, is he your Lord? He gave us a command and said, celebrate. Every time you come together, observe this communion, observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of what I have done for you. Are we his people? Are we not his chosen? Are we not the ones that call him Lord? Is he your Lord? Jesus commands us to pray in faith and don't waver, don't have doubt. But we pray and we pray and we doubt that God is going to do what we've asked him to do. My question is, if I'm praying but I don't have faith in what I'm praying, I've got to ask, is he my Lord? The question I want us to answer and understand today, is Jesus Lord of your life? Is Jesus the Lord and master in control of your life? Are you doing what he's asked you to do or are you doing what you want to do? Have you quoted the poem in Vectus? I'm the captain of my fate. I'm the master of my own soul. Are you allowing Jesus to be Adonai, your master, your Lord? The question is, is Jesus your Lord or is somebody else your Lord? Amen.